Hey folks, welcome to English 261, week number 7. Um, this week we're going to cover the Romantics and the Americans, um, the last two weeks of reading. I decided I'm going to break that up into two lectures simply because of the time framing, um, also because my throat will probably give out at some point if I went through all of it at once, and we'd rather not have that happen, or at least I'd rather not have that happen. You might feel otherwise. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the Romantics and the Americans this, um, in this lecture. I'll post another lecture later in the week where I'll say we'll cover the rest of the Romantics and the Americans to kind of get us caught up. But also this lecture is going to start off by kind of covering what you need to do this week before I start digging into the material. So what you need to do for this week is there's selections to read for week seven, so I'd like you to read those because we'll talk about those next week. Um, critique Poetry Project 6, the Sinquain. I'm working your poetry analysis paper, which is going to be due, I believe, on the 25th, I think I said. I can verify that for you here while I'm looking at it. Uh, yep, March 25th, um, right before spring break. And also work on Poetry Project 7, the Rondo. Um, the Rondeau is a uh, classic French form. Um, it has multiple rhyme schemes and also adds in something new to our uh, schema of what poet forms work. The refrain, which is a line that gets repeated at multiple points in the poem. Um, there's examples of it. There's information on how they're written, um, written on um, in poets.org. So I really recommend you make use of that and read some examples of Rondeaus as well. Um, one bit of advice when you're working with a refrain, um, let me tell you, Think of a, word, a line that is general enough that it's going to apply in multiple situations, but also specific and intriguing enough that readers are going to be okay with seeing it multiple times. That's really the trick of getting a rondo, of getting a refrain down, is it needs to be something that readers are going to be okay with it repeating, but it also needs to be general enough that it's going to be able to fit multiple places within a poem. So refrain lines are kind of tricky. Um, and sometimes it's helpful to figure out what you want the refrain to be, then build the poem around it. So that might be something you might consider as well. Okay? <clears throat> okay. So that's in terms of the actual, um, what you'll be doing in terms of the work and the writing for this week. Um, I'll be grading the poetry analysis, pay, um, poetry bundles um, at some point this week and into next week, so those should be back to you shortly as well. Um, hopefully I'll have those back to you quickly as I can. Um, what I'm going to do is what I usually do, I'll give line comments, but then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to record um, commentary on these. All right? So let's go ahead and talk about the Romantic and the early American poets. In the Romantic period, really starts off in the late 18th century and continues into the early 20th century. Or into the early 19th century, sorry, the 20th century is modernism. Uh, the Romantic period really kind of kicks off in there, and the really kind of the features of Romanticism. Um, romanticism was interested in ideas of freedom, both political and personal. One of the things that happens is um, Romanticism was deeply invested in and influenced by the revolutions that had occurred in the United States, France, and in other areas of Europe. So the Romantics were very, very interested, and the Romantics were mainly British, so they saw this from the perspective of um, people who were actually kind of in a dominating authority at the time, but they were really interested in what the Americans had done, they were really interested in what the French had done in terms of their revolutions. And even in this time period in England, there were some, sort of, there were some revolutions going on, there were some changes going on in the political structure of England that were um, stripping the powers from the monarchy to some extent and giving them to the common people and giving them to represented authorities. So this was kind of a time of democracy and the idea that the individual in society matters. And it was an also a time of less interest in democracy, and sorry, not in democracy, in monarchies and centralized authorities. So there's definitely an interest in the idea of the heroic individual, and that was one of the other things that came out of this, is romantics very much believed in the trials and tribulations and thoughts and hopes and dreams of the romantic or the heroic individual. 
there is very much a belief among the romantics that human beings were capable of greatness. Human beings were incredibly powerful and human beings were beautiful in their emotions and in their feelings and in their aesthetic senses and their, in their capabilities to create things and their capabilities to create beauty. There was very much, um, romanticism was very, very humanistic. But in a nostalgic and somewhat pathetic way. And by what I, and take this with a grain of salt. Um, I will be entirely honest with you. I'm not a huge fan of the Romantics in general. Um, but the Romantics were very, very nostalgic in the sense of they believed that human beings were really, really capable of all kinds of sorts of greatness. But also they were very pathetic because they believed that human beings at the extremes of their emotional um, spectrums were beautiful and powerful and those extremities were matter. They were very much interested in extremes of thought and emotion and pleasure and physicality. And they also to some extent saw connections between themselves and the Greeks. There was also very much an interest in the Greeks in this time period, and it, it, to some extent has very much to do with the fact that the Greeks were a democratic society. Um, the rest of um, other places in the world are finally becoming democratic again. There was also an interest in the Greeks for the simple fact that um, the Romantics saw themselves as kind of poetic um, followers of the Greeks, or um, poetic uh, children of the Greeks, and they also saw themselves in very much in kind of the same humanist terms as the Greeks, because the Greeks were also humanists. The Greeks were very, very tempered humanists when we talk about humanism. Um, but the Romantics saw themselves in that kind of belief in the human spirit um, that the Greeks had. So the Romantics were very, very interested in the idea of the heroic individual. And um, they were prone to being dramatic and melodramatic as well as erudite um, artistic aesthetic and compelling and I think in one of the things you might detect depending on how you feel about kind of over-the-top emotional expression um, in the romantics you might find when your own reading of the romantic work you might find those notes of like Ugh, this is just too much. Um, and I sometimes find that in the romantic work. But however, there's other romantic works I find absolutely beautiful, um, depending on who the writer is and what they're kind of doing and what they're trying to do. Um, I'll tell you right now, we'll talk about it here when we go through this. I think the poem Adonais is, if anyone ever wrote something like that for me after I died, I would be wildly unhappy just at how over the top it is. It's the, equi it's the literary equivalent of throwing yourself in someone's coffin, which um, Keats might have liked. I don't necessarily know, but it's not my favorite poem in here, but I do think it's a very important poem. We will talk a bit about um, what it's doing and kind of why it's representative and why it's interesting in relation to the Romantics period. But the Romantics were very kind of... Um, very interesting and kind of very talented in a lot of regards, but they were also very prone to kind of over-the-top behaviors and over-the-top um, excesses and over-the-top emotions. The other thing that romantics were interested in is the romantics had a fondness and appreciation for the natural world. And this comes very much on the heels of like William Blake and the proto-romantics. Um, the Romantics really, really cared about nature, and it's partly because um, their love of nature stems from their dissatisfaction with the mechanization of the Industrial Revolution. One of the things that happens with the Enlightenment is we begin to see a beginning of industry in um, Europe, and we begin to see um, scientific developments that allow for things like mechanization that, or more and more degrees of automation or more and more urban growth. So one of the things um, that the Romantics were very much kind of against was the, um, the idea that the urban world was the center of the world. Um, romantics questioned the value in humanity of urban dwelling, even though a great many of them were urban dwellers.
but they very much tended to romanticize the natural world, um, and they saw themselves, um, they saw in many ways uh, the relationship between human and nature is being somewhat sacred. And that kind of falls in the heels of philosophers like Rousseau and things along those lines who believe that it was really society that corrupted humans, not um, any sort of nature inherent to human beings themselves. Um, so the Romantics had kind of similar beliefs that it was really society and industrialization that were actually corrupting people, not the natural world and their relation to it. And if we could get back to nature, it would be more effective. Well, this is very common. Um, we see in people like Emerson and Thoreau and things like that on the American side. Um, we also see it to some extent in Wordsworth and uh, some of the other Romantic poets. So the Romantics had a fondness for that appreciation of the natural world. But really the Romantics, um, they were very much interested. Um, the Romantics poetry tends to be big, bright, wrought, and announcing of itself. At its worst, it's pathetic. It just has overly wrought emotions, melodramatic, and self-indulgent. At its best, it's beautiful, intelligent, well thought and does an amazing job of capturing the essence of human experience and emotion. And I think that um, we find both in the Romantic poets. Um, sometimes, yeah, they go a little too far, but one of the things that the risk of going to the edge is falling over the side of it, and that tended to happen every now and then with some of the Romantic poets. Um, in their personal lives, that happened quite a bit as well. So let's go ahead, since we're here, and kind of dig into some of the work. We'll start with William Wordsworth, then we'll talk about Samuel Coleridge. Um, William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge were actually uh, poets that were actually part of what was called the Lake School. Um, they were um, poets who lived in the Lake District of England um, in the early part of the 17th and the 18th, 19th century, and that's kind of when they were working and writing in this area. And Wordsworth is probably. Um, the most famous of the Lake Poets, and probably the first and most famous of the first um, Romantics, followed, of course, by uh, Coleridge. And you can kind of see in their work um, very much the beginning of uh, the ideas of what would later come from their work, uh, come into the Romantic play. So, for example, if we look on page 458 at um, lines, uh, lines from Tintern Abbey, one of the things you begin to see here is just the really strong attention to detail in the natural detail he's seeing and how much that's impacting um, the human behavior. Um, it's a really lovely blank verse for the most part here, um, but he does a really kind of good job of just detailing all of the little features he sees and all the things. These plots of cottage around, these orchard tufts, which at the season these unripe poops are clad in gleaning, he lose themselves amid groves of corpses. Just these little details and descriptions. There's a real love of nature that shines through in this whole thing. And then, of course, after that, it starts taking into how that affects the human, how it affects the spirit, how it affects the heart, how it affects the natural body. Um, and hours of weariness and sentient sweet felt in the blood and felt along the heart and even passing even to pure mind with tranquil restoration feelings too of unremembered pleasure. Just the thought of the nature brings him back to a, a better place in his spirit and in his life. And it goes on for that. And it's really that kind of... Um, here you're really seeing this very strong pastoral sense of being the pastoral being more important than the city. And just the idea that... Um, all of this nature is just it's connections to the human being and issues of aging. And it's really, in many ways, um, it's a reflection of nature, but it's also a long reflection on um, human experience and uh, just the overall sense of um, what it's like to be alive and all these different kinds of thoughts associated with it. It's a long kind of... Um, one might call it rambling, um, but it's very beautiful for the most part, and it's very well wrought, and it's very carefully crafted. But it's very much um, 
uh, just a reflection, it's a very kind of very early good example of what the Romantics were all about. This idea of what the human experience was like and what it meant to be human and the pains and the wonders of that, but also the beauty of nature in relation to those things. And it really kind of covers all of that kind of um, issues. Uh, just uh, this, that sad still music of humanity, nor harsh nor grating, though of ample power to chase and subdue. Just all kinds of different ideas tied into there. And it's got kind of a very meditative um, stream of consciousness quality, which begins to come into play here with the Romantics and later on gets picked up more in modernism. But um, because it's what seems to be stream of consciousness really is actually incredibly wrought in the modernist as opposed to what you might find in a James Joyce later on down the road. But um, it's a very good example of just an early, early romantic poem and what the romantics were all about. And I think Wordsworth is an effective, does an effective job of this. And one of the things that Wordsworth does um, that I think is really worth mentioning is Wordsworth is, was very interested in the idea of expressing poetic beauty through very kind of common natural language. He was not someone who was really interested in making all kinds of allusions to other things. He was very much interested in... Um, using commonplace images, using commonplace language and commonplace phrasing to connect to the reader. So it's a little bit less formal in some extent in terms of language choices than other poems you might have read up until now because it's not trying to be formal. It's trying to speak to um, the common experience of humanity as opposed to any particular higher or upper level experience of humanity. And you can kind of see that um, when she dwelled among untrodden ways, once again we've got that kind of same idea, romantic ideal, and it's just a very kind of classic lyric poem with some um, some effective rhyming lines. But it's very much um, that just that idea of the romantic idea of the human d death and the human life and how fragile and how short it is. I mean, look at the she dwelt among the untrodden ways beside the springs of dove, a maid whom there was none to praise and very few to love. A violet by mossy stone, half hidden from the eye, fair as a star when only one is shining in the sky. She lived unknown and few could know when Lisi ceased to be, but she is in her grave and oh, the difference to me. It's the idea of like, I love this one person and this person's life was over and this person was lost and no one will ever know. I mean, it is very much the idea of human suffering and the shortness and the frailty of human life. And you can kind of see this in Wordsworth's work. Wordsworth is a very wonderful poet. He's probably one of... Um, He's generally recognized as one of the great poets of the English language. But um, he was very much kind of an early, early um, writer in the Romantic mode. And a lot of what he did established what the Romantic mode would be. Um, we can kind of see that to the same extent when we move on to um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. <coughs> and Coleridge um, was also a Lake poet. Um, he was interested in philosophy, th uh, theology, and he was also kind of very political, r very radical politically, but also um, uh, theologically as well. He was very kind of interested in alternative t beliefs and religion and things along those lines. Um, he was very interested in that conversational language, and he was actually the one who talked about it more, perhaps, than Wordsworth did. The Wordsworth very much used it, and it's very clear that Coleridge learned a fair amount about that from Wordsworth. Um, but we're Coleridge was more along the lines of looking at the historical greatness of humanity and the kinds of things that humans did. Um, and another thing that Coleridge has tended to be um, tied up in was drug use. Um, if fairly often you'll hear people talk about Coleridge's work in relation to Col Coleridge being high um, or Coleridge being using opium or things along those lines. Chances are he probably did. Whether that has anything to do with the work I would not speculate nor necessarily have anything to say about. But one of the things um, Coleridge liked to do was he often claimed that he had dreams that gave him fragments of ideas and that was how he generated his work. And Kubla Khan was one of those. He was writing about a dream he had. And um, the Kubla Khan story is actually of course rooted in history but you can kind of see, as you read through the Kublai Khan, you're also seeing these references to greatness of early kind of heroic and mythical figures, um, such as the Khans, but also tied to this, um, the beautiful and um, just kind of epic aspect of humanity and human works and human doings and things along those lines. So you get a really kind of strong sense in Kublai Khan of... Um, it kind of feels like reading a very, very... I mean, this kind of stuff is eventually what, like, Robert Howard would pick up and turn into Conan the Barbarian in a kind of lesser, um, more populist form than what Col 
Coleridge is doing here. But this kind of stuff did provide the basis for that. It's very much um, fantastical views of human experience and nature and what humans have done and just kind of the overwrought language of the whole thing and the overblown language. The shadow of the dome of pleasure floated midway on the waves where was heard the mingled measure from the fountains in the caves. It was a miracle of rare device, a sunny pleasure dome with caves of ice. Just this idea of like an ice cave in the sun. I mean, all these different kinds of features of just this wondrous um, cave that had this wondrous man, Kubla Khan, in it. And it was very kind of... Um, really kind of reaching back to the idea of human grandeur in the past and also great human men and the importance of them in relation to wonders in the world and things along those lines. And that was a lot of what Coleridge was about. Um, the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner has that too. And the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner it tends to be a bit bleaker and a little bit darker than Kubla Khan, but this kind of idea of adventure and this kind of idea of getting out and seeing the world and doing things in the world and experiencing the world in kind of an epic way was very much part of... Um, Coleridge's contribution to the romantic poetry and the romantic sentiments of the time. So Coleridge um, is definitely taking worth it. And then we get, of course, into kind of the second generation of um, poets, which would be George. Um, we'll start with George Gordon on page 510, She Walks in Beauty. And this is one of the interesting poems. Um, it's interesting because, first of all, He's describing a woman, but there's no clear feature of any particular woman in here. Um, for the most part, Raven Tresses is the only thing that he actually says that really says anything in particular about um, any one particular woman here. So you could actually apply this poem to all kinds of women, um, which is probably something that Gordon probably did. Uh, Lord Byron George Gordon um, was very, very well known for being a philanderer, a gambler. Um, he was kind of a... He was basically the equivalent of a Victorian Hilton. Um, he was a party monster for the most part. Um, if there was a rock star in um, Romantic period England in the early in the early to mid very er, in the early half of the uh, eight, 19th century, that would have been George Gordon. Um, he was a kind of the wild child of uh, the aristocracy, and to some extent, um, his life kind of reflected that. Um, there was rumors that he was having an incestuous relationship with his sister. Um, he had an illegitimate daughter who actually became the first computer programmer, um, Ada Byron, um, Lady Ada Byron, who was actually also an inveterate gambler, um, but also a really brilliant mathematician. Um, but She Walks in Beauty, you can kind of read it, and it's very much just that kind of Oh, the beauty of the human, the beauty of the woman. It's very much that kind of writing. And it's a great lyric poem. Um, he's a, very good at using languages, and he's very good at um, pairing and creating rhyme. But if you look at it, there's not a whole lot to identify a particular woman here. It's kind of just speaking about, it could be speaking about women in general, which, to be fair, is probably something that um, Byron might have done with it. And that's partly why I chose this poem. Um, because I find it interesting that, that I think that he probably very well could have used it that way and very much intended to use it that way. Um, he, but he, it was very reflective of the appreciation the Romantics had for beauty. I mean, the Romantics were the kind of people who would see um, a, someone gorgeous and just hold their chests and kind of collapse. I mean, they would do that kind of thing. It's very much a fainting couch um, kind of aesthetic, and I think that's kind of uh, interesting to look at here. But it's very much in that time period. And, Gord, and Byron... Um, was what was called a second generation romantic, which means he came after Wordsworth and um, Coleridge and the other late poets. But um, it was Byron was also friends with Keats and he was also friends with um, Percy Shelley and also in turn Mary Shelley, who um, actually was the one who wrote Frankenstein, and they were actually, um, both of them were present um, when Frankenstein was first told as a short story. It was told in a uh, lake in Italy. Um, they were on a vacation. They decided they were going to tell ghost stories, and that's kind of what ended, where Frankenstein ultimately ended up coming from. Just a weird bit of literary history. But She Walks in Beauty is um, very much kind of the idea of the romantic and the beautiful human and is being uh, transcendent above all things. And Don Juan was kind of one of his classic poems, and what a shocker there, given how he um, conducted himself. And it's definitely his, probably his longest poem, and it's probably one of these most famous for. But the reason I included um, on 537, on this day I complete my 36th year, is because I think it's very telling um, about the romantic sentiment. Um, in Missolonghi was um, a town, the town in Greece. One of the things that happened later on in his life, after um, Byron had basically uh, 
kind of run out of money, had basically burned most of his bridges in England, was he went to fight in the Greek War for Independence. And the reason he decided to do this was because he wanted his life to mean something, and he wanted to fight for something he cared about because he had all these romantic notions about war was. And that's really kind of what you find in On This Day I Complete My 36th Year. Tis time this heart should be unmoved, since it's, uh, it's others it has ceased to move. He's basically saying, I'm not a great poet anymore. People, I don't move people anymore. Whatever, I'm going off to war. Yet though I cannot be beloved, still let me love. Let me spend my time. Let me vo devote myself to something that matters. My days are in the yellow leaf. The flowers and fruits of love are gone. The worm and the canker and the grief are mine alone. My life is ending. I'm getting older. It's all falling apart. I mean, it's very kind of pathetic. Um, it's the stuff that you do when you're basically, you're having the lordy lordy I'm turning 40 party, except you're really kind of bemoaning it in ways that may not quite be socially acceptable. But really what he's talking about here is he's talking about if I can't live honorably, and if I can't live with respect, and I can't live as a great poet, then let me die as a soldier. Let me die as someone fighting for something that matters. And that's really kind of what he talks about. Uh, and that's really kind of a very romantic notion about what war is. But the romantics carry these romantic notions is in the fact that romance is named after them. They had this very kind of clear idea that war for independence or fighting for freedom was somehow noble, and it was somehow meaningful, and it was somehow important. And the reason I have you read this poem is because there's great use of um, the poetic language here. And I, as always, I recommend you scan these poems and see what they're doing. Um, and I d we would do that myself. We just don't seem to have the time given what we need to cover and the amount of space we have in the class. But um, there's a lot of um, very kind of romantic sentiment about warfare here. And the reason I like this poem, the reason I had you read it, is because I want you to remember this poem. Because when we come around to talk about um, Dover Beach, you're going to see a very, very different view of what war is. And we come to see, especially not, sorry, not Dover Beach, we come to Winifred Owen, um, Wilfred Owen, in World War II, you see a very, very different view of war and a very, very different perspective on what war is that has a lot to do with the different kind, how warfare changed between this part of the 19th century and the 20th century. So it's um, a very great poem, and it's very much, um, and it's also impacted by the fact that after writing this, within months, um, Byron was dead. Uh, he died of, uh, he died of, I believe it was pneumonia. Um, yeah, I believe he died of pneumonia in Greece when he, uh, where he'd gone to fight for the War of Independence. So he basically wanted to die in battle. He ended up dying of sickness uh, in a combat field somewhere, which is really unfortunate. Um, so let's talk about Shelley. And when we talk about Shelley, Shelley is really kind of possibly one of the most famous um, of the uh, second generation romantics. Um, we don't know him all that well here. We tend to know Gordon a little bit more, but we tend to know Gordon because of his um, really kind of overall behavior. And we tend to know Keats because Keats, technically speaking, historically, is probably a better poet. Um, but there's some really classic Shelley poems, such as Ozymandias, which I actually had you read here. And Ozymandias, in some ways, ties in very much to what Coleridge kind of did, was talk about the greatness of human experience and the greatness of human um, behaviors and the things that humans r um, create. But Shelley undercuts it by pointing out that it's a wreck. Um, the giant statue has fallen. It's not going anywhere. It's not... Um, Ozymandias thought he was going to be mighty and he was going to be the ruler, but it's gone. Um, time has taken it away. And it's very much in some ways similar to the reflection Wordsworth made um, and uh, the reflection Wordsworth made when he was talking about Lucy um, in the shortness of her life, but in this case he's talking about Ozymandias believes he's a great man and he's powerful of great things, but time has swept him away and has wrought, brought his empire to nothing. And that too in some ways is bittersweet that the great things you build will be gone and taken from you. So it's almost like looking at Kubla Khan um, from the perspective of a thousand years in the future that this will be wiped away too. And the Romantics of course would find that beautiful, the, temp the transient nature of things. So Ozymandias kind of continues with that kind of theme of the idea of greatness and human greatness and the fact that in the face of time it's eroded and goes away. Um, and then we have Adon Adonais, and one of the things I think is worth talking about in Adonais, this is really, um, it's for Keats, and it's an elegy on the death of Keats, and he makes it 
he it's so packed with Greek allusions that it's a really great exemplar of how much um, the Romantic poets respected the Greek poets and the ideas and the things that the Greeks held to them true about poetry. And it's also um, talking about a famous mythological death, and it also ties into the fact um, that uh, Shelley believed that Keats um, should deserve this beautiful death and this beautiful... Um, powerful funeral and it tied and it basically is turning um, Keats into a myth even though he just recently died it's eulogizing him into the mythology of poetry and that's really kind of what Shelley was intending to do here it's a epic poem and it's one of um, it's an interesting epic poem but this was a time when epic poems were still being written and I would say that one of the things worth um, noting about the romantics is the romantics really did believe in epic poetry the, the romantics really believed in the power of poetry they believed in the power of words and the power of language and they loved epic poetry they loved writing long form poems that went on and on and on told stories of these great people even great people in their times and so when Shelley is mythologizing Keats to the Greeks, he's not doing it insincerely. He's not doing it making comparisons. He is saying that uh, Keats was as powerful and as important as these Greek poets are going to be. And ultimately, he may very well have been true because Keats is extremely well respected. Um, Keats was not very well respected in his time period, um, but he was very much so later on. But before we go to Keats, let's talk very quickly about Felicia Dorothea, he Dorothea Hemans. And I think one of the things that's interesting to note about Casabianca is um, Felicia Dorothea Hemans was not necessarily a very well-respected poet um, after her life, but in her time she was very, very well known. And she was actually known um, and read heavily by children and by young people. And one of the things I think is really interesting about Casabianca, and one of the reasons I think that we're now paying more attention to Felicia Dorothea Hemans, is a lot of what she did spoke to a different kinds of ex kind of experience of the Romantic Age than the men of the Romantic Age were speaking to. Um, whereas, for example, you get someone like Gordon really selling the importance of warfare and heroism and all these kinds of things. Hemmons here in Casabianca is undercutting a lot of that by flat out basically saying, um, yeah, it was a heck of a battle and it was really kind of meaningful, but you know what happened? A kid died. And you get to that last end with mast and helm and pen and fair that well had borne their part, but the noblest thing that perished there was that young faithful heart. It's pointing out, it undercuts that a human being or a child was lost in this war. And it does, it really in some ways, it reinforces that idea of the importance of noble warfare and the importance of living for empire and nation and all of those things that... Um, the Romantics believed in, or believed in a strong and powerful heroic individual, but it also undercuts it by pointing out that a child died. And it kind of does a very interesting twist there at the end, <clears throat> that she goes through all this kind of how powerful and wonderful and how epic the whole thing is, and then and she points out, but really what was lost here, the noblest thing that was lost was a child. It wasn't what was lost here with Mass and Helm and Pen and Fair that well had borne their part, but the noblest thing which perished there was that young, faithful heart. What she's saying is that human beings suffer for nations. So it kind of undercuts the idea that what's really important is the human suffering in a war, not the nation, not the flag, not the independence, not the ideology that you're fighting for, but the people that are lost. So it's kind of undercutting in an interesting way something you might find in Byron, which I think is one of the reasons that we're paying more attention to Felicia Dorothea Hemans now than we have in the past. Then we move on to Keats. And Keats, um, as far as romantics go, if I had to pick a favorite, it would probably be Keats. And the reason I would pick Keats as my favorite is because Keats, I think, he really does an amazing job of capturing the beauty of what the romantic spirit was about without tending to fall into the bathos or um, the kind of overwrought aspects of it. I also tend to think that Keats was the um, more the intellectual one of them. Um, Keats also did not live a long life. He died, I believe, in his 20s of tuberculosis. And Ode and a Grecian Urn, um, one of the things I really like about this, it's probably the most ec famous ekphrasis poem ever written, but I also really like it because it really does an effective job of thinking about what art is um, and what art means, and also really kind of covering and detailing what this urn has on it. So, for example, just kind of these... Um, 
and the idea that art is a historian, I think, is really kind of introspective because it shows that art says something about its time and its period. But also um, things like, Fair youth beneath the trees, thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can thy trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss, thou winning near the goal, yet do not grieve. Just that idea of this story is framed forever in time and will never complete itself. And that's what happens in the urn, is it captures a story in a moment, but it's a story we don't actually get into. And it really shows just... Um, kind of the way that Keats's mind could work and kind of dance around an issue and take it in from all kinds of different perspectives and really break down and look at it from all these different angles. And I think it's one of the things that makes Keats such an interesting poet is his be the use of language is beautiful and very, very effective and he's very well educated. Um, and he makes a lot of great references. One of the things I really love about Keats is Keats can play with all these different ideas of what things are and how they represent themselves in the world. And I think um, Bright Star, we kind of find that too. Um, the idea of wanting to live as long as a star is going to, um, this burn as brightly as a star is going to, because he knows for a fact he's not going to be able to. Um, I mean, bright star is very, very beautiful. Bright star, would I, would I were as steadfast as thou art, not in lone splendor, hung aloft the night, and watching with eternal lids apart, like nature's patient, sleepless eremite, the moving waters of their priest light task of pure absolution round Earth's human shores or gazing on the new soft fallen mask of snow upon mountains and the moors. And he wants to be detached. He wants to be that changeless um, thing that's going to last and be able to watch forever and ever and ever. And he knows he's not going to be able to do that. And I think it's one of the things that's kind of lovely about that poem is um, Keats recognizes his own mortality. But at the same time, um, instead of just kind of running around bemoaning himself, what he talks about is why he wants to stay. And it's he wants to see the world. He wants to see um, everything out there. And he wants to be able to kind of exist and just keep going on and on and on. And I think it's kind of a lovely um, kind of way to phrase that sense of what you really what you really lose by being human or also kind of what you gain by being human as well. So he's a, I'm a fan of that um, for a number of reasons. And then, of course, we get to... Um, <coughs> the first of our Americans, which is Ralph Waldo Emerson. And Emerson, um, in case any of you don't know, what Emerson is really famous for is he's not a romantic necessarily, but he's a transcendentalist. And the transcendentalist included um, writers such as Emerson and Thoreau. And what they were really interested in was they had some very romantic ideas, but they were the kind of the American branch of the romantics. Um, the transcendentalists believe in the kind of triumphant human individual spirit, and they also believe very much in sticking, staying close to nature and away from society, probably more so even the romantic did because um, the transcendentalists were more likely to actually live in kind of rough or wild areas, though despite the fact that that's all overwrought as well. Emerson was kind of an armchair, um, armchair uh, ubermensch, we might want to say, in the sense that he was actually quite wealthy, quite comfortable, and um, from what I gathered, basically his wife waited on him hands and hand and foot. And as a matter of fact, Thoreau, to some extent, um, was constantly borrowing money from Emerson, and Thoreau was always coming home from lunch when he was out in Walden Pond. So, um, as much as they might want to thought they were independent and wild men living in the woods, they were pretty pampered. Um, and Emerson, I think, more so was probably more reflective and more admittant of that in his work. But he was very, very interested. Um, if you read, for example in the snowstorm, the idea that nature has its own personality and it's an individual and it's strong and it's powerful and it's a builder, I mean that's very much in line with the transcendentalist idea that man in nature and man existing in nature is the natural state and the important part of things as opposed to being removed from society. And one of the things you kind of notice that gets kind of buried under all of this is the fact that snowstorms in that time period very frequently killed people. Um, so there's not a lot of um, reference to that, but there's more and more reference to the idea that this is nature's way of building, this is nature's way of conquering, this is man. It's almost like nature is a man creating through a snowstorm such as, and it's a very kind of conflating humans and nature, and which the transcendentalists like to do. Um, intellect, to some extent, does that as well. Because one of the things also that um, Emerson believed in, the transcendentalists believed in, is the importance of action as opposed to contemplation. Um, Emerson, of course, was not particularly great about that. He spent most of his life contemplating as opposed to acting. But hey, this is how this thing tends to go. But when intellect, if you read it um, over here, it says, rule by which, which by obeying grows, knowledge not its fountain knows, a wave removing from whom 
wave removing whom it bears from the shores which he compares adding wings through things to range makes to him his own blood strange what is they're basically talking about here is that the more time you spend contemplating the less time you spend acting and doing the more distant you become of what your um, actual existence is in the world and that's kind of a very simple idea but it was very very telling of what the transcendentalist belief was about action um, Emerson of course is famous for saying um, consistently is the hobgoblin of little minds. Um, and one of the things, reasons Emerson said that was that he said, well, I can, you can change your views and you can, experience should change who you are and you should be able to change through living. And that's kind of what intellect is about, is not getting so couched in the intellectual or pursuit of knowledge that you begin to pay, not pay attention to the physical world. And before we go on to Elizabeth Barrett Browning, because I think Elizabeth Barrett Browning is an interesting one, um, because she kind of sums up the romantics and also her work pivots towards the Gothic and the later, um, the post, -ra the pre-Raphaelite and the Victorian poets. Um, let's talk about Henry Wordsworth Long Wadsworth Longfellow. And one of the things um, from the Song of Hiawatha, Wadsworth Longfellow was probably, he was an extremely popular poet in the United States. And um, one of the things um, that Wads Longfellow was really, really interested in was the idea of America having its own distinct mythology and its own distinct culture separate from um, the United Kingdom and also separate from the Greeks and the Romans in Europe. And a lot of what Longfellow wrote about was about the great things he saw in America. He wrote about the great tales of America. He wrote about the myths of America. He wrote about the legends of America. And the Song of Hiawatha as much as it's obviously in a cultural appropriation and as much as from what I've gathered he misunderstood parts of the actual story itself it is um, it is somewhat admirable to say that Longfellow tried very very hard to at least pay attention to the culture that was around him and what was already here in the United States or what was already here in the New World when he was writing about thinking about what mythology should be and what America could be or what we should be building our mythology on. Longfellow very much believed that we should not be building our American culture on um, the Greeks and the Romans and the United Kingdom. Longfellow believed that we needed a culture independent of that that was very much American in and of itself. And the Song of Hiawatha is like that. And if you read the Song of Hiawatha, you notice that it has um, a lot of the features of epic poems. It has the repetition. It has um, the kind of attempt to create kind of like a beat to it or the sense of there's drums behind it or create kind of a song or even kind of to try to tie it to um, some sort of like tribal structures or um, sounds and meanings. And the, he, despite the fact that he's doing this in a very, very European way, using very, very European poetic techniques, he is making the effort. And I think... Um, it is an awareness, um, if not entirely um, well realized, that uh, Native Americans had something to contribute to American culture. Um, it's coming from a um, white man. It's very unfortunate that he's the one who's doing this and also writing it necessarily in this way. And it's somewhat problematic. He didn't understand the language or exactly the, what the story was. But he was very interested in understanding what the culture of America was and how that culture would affect and impact America going forward. So um, Longfellow is an interesting man in that regard because he really kind of starts thinking about a new way of thinking about poetics that isn't so much tied to Europe and to the Greeks and to the Romans and to that history that's actually rooted in what America had to offer in the American experience and the experiences of people in the United States now and before. So I think it's kind of an interesting way of looking at that. And it also in many ways establishes a good base for what Walt Whitman does, which is Whitman breaks very, very extensively from a lot of the formal things that Europeans did and tries to do a very, very different kind of wild verse. And it's very much um, an American feeling kind of poetry. It's very distinct from European poetry. And that was what Whitman's contribution was. And in many ways, Whitman was building off of Longfellow. So Longfellow, I think, is interesting in that regard. Last but not least, let's talk about Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Um, <clears throat> Elizabeth Barrett Browning, I very much um, appreciate her work. And I think... Um, from Aurora Lee, from Book Five, The Present Age, is a really lovely poem that really kind of um, encapsulates what the Romantics were really about um, thinking. And I think it comes very much down to, um, she makes a lot of these historic references in the beginning um, and how important they are, but then she kind of in the third, uh, second stanza, 
I, um... Let's see, is it the second stanza? The idea of a pewter age, yeah, mixed metal, silver wash, an age of scum. The idea of seeing your own time as being somehow less than the past because you're living within it. And she's pointing out that there's a real mistake we make um, as we live of not seeing the greatness in the world in the times we're living through it, but in looking back and trying to find greatness there. Um, she starts off with a line that say, um, every age though being beheld too close is ill discerned by those who have not li lived past it. That idea that you have to live past it, the, idea, the idea that somehow your age only means something after you die to her seems very nonsensical. We should be looking for heroism, we should be looking for greatness in our own age. And I think the second to last stanza is one of my favorite here. Um, Nay, if there's room for poets in this world, a little grow overgrown, I think there is. Their sole work is to represent the age, their age, not Charlemagne's, this live throbbing age that brawls, cheats, maddens, calculates, aspires, and spends more passion, more heroic heat betwixt the mirrors of its drawing rooms than Roland with his knights at Roncevalles. To flinch from the modern varnish, coat or flounce, cry out for togas and for the picturesque, it's fatal, foolish too. King Arthur's self was commonplace to Lady Guinevere and Camelot to minstrel seemed as flat as Fleet Street to our poets. It's just the idea that, that we live in a great age. We live in a great time. There are heroes now. And I think that one of the things that Browning does a lovely job of is just pointing out the ways in which we ignore the greatness of our own age and our own time in worshiping the past. And I think that's very telling and it very much encapsulates a lot of what the romantic um, spirit was about was recapturing that idea of heroism in the present age instead of just trying to find it in the past for the Greeks. It's almost um, an idea of recal re um, recapturing what it means to live in a golden age and creating a golden age and now as opposed to looking back and trying to find a golden age and thinking of your time as somehow less than that. So I think that Browning does a very, very good job of that in that regard. So next um, lecture we'll talk about the rest of the kind of um, pre-Raphaelite, late Victorian, late Romantic Victorian poets and also the um, Civil War poets in the United States and they'll kind of catch us up as we start moving more and more into modernism. So if you have any questions or concerns, please let me know. Otherwise, take care, be well, and I will talk to you folks again in a couple of days.